Good evening, everybody, and welcome to an event which aims at answering a question larger than life. What's at the other end of a black hole? You are probably watching us from Facebook, where you can have the translation in Italian, thanks to the help of Maria Cristina Massa and Anna De Poli, or you can follow us live on YouTube. My name is Elisabetta Kurzel. I am a science journalist and have the pleasure tonight of introducing a very special guest, James Beecham, physicist at CERN, Geneva. But before getting to the heart of our meeting, let me take a moment for the official greetings. Muse and IPSA are the institutions which wanted for this 2020 European Researchers' Night, a special event with a very special guest. You all know that the Researchers' Night is a Europe-wide public event that brings researchers closer to the general public. In order to enjoy the event, you do not need to be a specialist nor to have a scientific background. And James Beecham, the speaker of tonight, is a great scientist and a great disseminator, capable of inspiring all of us with his studies and his reflection. I am speaking from Muse, the Museum of Science in Trento, Italy, which organized this event, and I bring you the greetings of Michele Lanzinger, the director of Muse. Greetings come also from IBSA, which is a partner in the organization of this event. IPSA Foundation was founded in 2012 in Lugano, Switzerland, and since then has been supporting young students and researchers. Among its many initiatives, the foundation promotes forums with internationally renowned scientists and commits itself to the dissemination of scientific culture. I'll hand it over to Silvia Misiti, director of IPSA. Bevo? Sorry? Oh, may maybe oh, it's it yeah, now you, we can hear you. Okay. Okay, so you. I can start again. So sorry, sorry for the inconvenience. I would like to thank um, Elizabeth for the nice introduction and uh, good evening to everyone. And thanks to be here in this uh, virtual virtual way here. Uh, thanks to the Museum of Science of Trento for our active partnership and for the organization of today. Along with uh, Sara, Claudia and the Electra of my team for the great job done. Uh, as Elizabeth said, education, supporting research and scientific dissemination are at the heart of the activities of our foundation, which is committed to promoting the culture of frontier science but also encouraging a greater awareness of issues related to people's health and well-being. We are very happy to take part in the Notte dei Ricercatori with an international guest as uh, James Beecham, who has become one of the IPSA Foundation's favorite testimonials, in addition to be a good friend of us. So good vision and uh, have a nice weekend to everybody. Thank you very much, Dr. Miziti. And now let's start. It's time to introduce you to our special guest, James Beecham. A particle physicist, Dr. James Beecham searches for answers to the biggest open questions of physics using the largest experiment ever, the Large Hadron Collider at CERN. He hunts for dark matter, gravitons, quantum black holes and dark photons as a member of the ATLAS collaboration, one of the teams that discovered the Higgs boson in 2012. In addition to his research, he is a frequent speaker at events on science, technology, digital culture, futurism and art, organized worldwide by such bodies as 
the American Museum of Natural History, the Royal Islands Institution, the Guggenheim Bilbao, and the BBC. His TED talk, How We Explored Unanswered Questions in Physics, has been viewed more than 1.5 million times. He regularly appears on podcasts, on radio shows, and in documentaries, and has been featured in the New York Times, Wired, and Gizmodo. Beecham trained as a filmmaker before becoming a physicist and regularly collaborates with artists. In 2015, he launched Ex Noise CERN, a project exploring the connection between particle physics and experimental music and film. Please remember that after his presentation, all participants are welcome with their questions. If you want to make a comment or ask a question, don't miss this opportunity to talk to one of the brightest scientists of today. Just post a comment and I will read it for you. So Dr. Beecham, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you to everyone. So first of all, can you verify that you can hear me? Yes, we can, very Fantastic. well. Okay, so yeah, thanks again to everyone at Musee Trento. I wish, I wish, wish, wish we could all be there in person. And I know that sometime in the future, we will be able to be there all in person. And thanks again to the people uh, at IBSA. Always fantastic to work with them. They somehow come up with the most inventive events that I've ever uh, that I've ever participated in. So, and all of this is preamble to the real question that I want to come here to ask you, which is, what's at the other end of a black hole? My friend Melody asked me this question when I was eight years old. I usually had good answers for science questions. I was sort of a library guy, but this time I had no idea what to say. The question was scary. I grew up in Southern Utah in the Western part of the United States. And this is the home of red rocks, hot, dry summer nights and clear, beautiful skies. And these are perfect conditions for stargazing. And as a kid, Melody and I would bicycle out of town to get away from the lights of the city. And we would stare up at the stars and we would ask each other questions about the universe. How big is the earth? What's the sun made of? Why do galaxies spin around? How far away is the edge of the universe? What's inside a black hole. When she asked me that one, I stopped, I paused, and I thought about it. And finally, I said, I don't know. And Melody said, some of my ancestors thought that the first people came out of a hole in the ground that opened up after a big rainstorm. Maybe there are like aliens inside a black hole. We stared up at the vast, dark cosmos. Yeah, but a black hole is a place where there's so much gravity that everything that goes in gets totally crushed, I said. Black holes suck in entire stars sometimes. I, I don't think aliens could be in there and still be alive. Melody was an indigenous Native American from a local tribe. I don't remember if she was Paiute or Navajo, and kids at school would often make fun of Melody, calling her nasty names. She didn't like tests, she didn't like homework assignments, but she ran circles around the other kids in classroom discussions with the teacher, and there was a reason she and I were friends, because Melody was never afraid to ask the big questions. And when she finally asked, what's at the other end of a black hole? The question caught me off guard. Well, nothing, I said. A black hole is like a huge trash compactor or like a really strong drain, like a bathtub drain. But in space, where if something gets too close, it gets sucked in forever 
and crushed completely. And Melody said, yeah, but when my mom's wedding ring fell in the bathtub drain, it wasn't lost forever. The plumber found it in the pipe under the dirt outside. We stared up at the stars sparkling like jewels. And finally I said, well, I don't know what's at the other end of a black hole, but I know for sure that if I fell into one, I, 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 I definitely try to crawl out. And Melody said, but you couldn't. Nothing can crawl out of a black hole. And we were silent for a long time. And finally I said, wow, black hole sounds terrible and really lonely. And even though there was really no danger of eight-year-old me falling into a black hole, the fact that black holes even exist is a terrifying prospect. An enormous cosmic vortex sucking in entire stars and crushing them into oblivion. Why do black holes even exist? But we're getting ahead of ourselves. Before we go too much further, we need to answer one very important question. What is a black hole, really? If you're watching this from home, chances are you're sitting on a chair or a sofa or standing at a table, and no matter where you are, no matter your gender or your skin color, you all have one very important thing in common. You're not currently floating around your room. Why are you not floating? Because of gravity, of course. Gravity is the force of attraction between any two big objects like the sun and the earth or between the earth and you. But gravity is not just any old force. Gravity does what it does because the presence of a large amount of stuff within a certain volume of space bends the fabric of space-time itself, causing one thing to fall into this bent space toward the other thing. A ship traveling through empty space is like a marble rolling along a rubber sheet. The marble always travels in a straight line from its own perspective. But if we put a bowling ball on the sheet, from an external perspective, the straight line path of the marble is bent as the marble falls toward the bowling ball. Gold is about 14 times denser than a bowling ball. So if we put a bowling ball sized chunk of gold there instead, the marble's path is bent even more severely. And if we finally put something so incredibly dense there, the bending will be so great that if it gets too close, the marble would never be able to get out and your spaceship, no matter how ferociously you fired its rockets, could not escape. And this is a black hole. For example, our sun deforms space to a certain degree and therefore the earth is falling toward the sun. A neutron star is much denser and you much, it's much more uh, compact and therefore, something that gets too close will be pulled even more. And a black hole, a black hole is the end. And this is what a black hole is. The center of a black hole is a mystery. But according to the mathematics of gravity, there should be a huge amount of stuff packed into <clears throat> a one-dimensional point of infinitely small volume and of infinitely curved space-time. And this is a singularity, and it's the place where the known laws of physics become meaningless. And a black hole is called black for a very good reason. Not only would it be impossible for you in your rocket ship to blast away from the black hole once you pass the point of no return, something we call the event horizon, but black holes bend space so radically that not even light, which travels at the fastest speed that anything can travel through space, can escape. But wait a minute. 
the clever ones amongst you are now asking, how is that possible? If you were standing on the sloping edge of a very steep sinkhole, or even if it were completely vertical and you were clinging to the side, as long as you have the right climbing gear, you could climb out. And in space, at the edge of a gravity sinkhole, even if we're very steep, of course light could still zoom away, right? Nope. But why not? It's because gravity in space is not exactly like a bent rubber sheet or like a sinkhole in the dirt like this one. Instead, a black hole in space is more like an unfathomably strong water drain where the water is the fabric of space itself. Imagine you're a fish in the water. The water is everything you know. The water is your background. And even if you swim close to a big drain, as long as you're strong enough, you can swim away from the danger. But if you get too close, the water itself is moving faster than you can possibly swim. And even if you swim at your po fastest possible speed, you will be carried into the drain. This is what happens with a black hole in space. If you're far away from a black hole, space doesn't move in any perceptible way. But as you get closer, the extreme gravity starts to bend space, starts to suck in space itself, and space moves inexorably toward the center of the black hole. But as long as you stay far enough away, and as long as you have a sufficiently powerful spaceship, you could still blast away from the black hole. But like I said, there's this very important point of no return called the event horizon. Because the event horizon is the point at which space is being sucked into the black hole at the speed of light. And no spaceship, no matter how powerful, can move at the speed of light. And the most alarming part of all is the fact that inside the event horizon, space is being sucked into the center of the black hole faster than the speed of light. This means that inside the event horizon of a black hole, no matter how powerful your spaceship, no matter how fast you try to zoom away, your trajectory would be directly into the center of the black hole, just like the fish trying to swim in one direction in water that's moving faster in the other direction. And if space is moving faster than light inside the event horizon of a black hole, this means that not even light itself can escape from a black hole. Black holes are empty, dark voids in space that completely suck in anything that gets too close to them. And they're all over the universe. But wait a minute. If black holes are completely dark, then how do we know they exist? I mean, this is an artist's rendition. If we could see this, that would be amazing. But we can't. How do we know black holes exist? Because we see dark spots in the night sky where stars seem to be orbiting around nothing. The star symbol in the middle of this animation is a completely black spot on the night sky. Obviously, something is there. Additionally, a black hole should create a distinct pattern of radio waves emitted from the hot bent gas around it, which, as you know, was detected by the Event Horizon Telescope collaboration just last year for a black hole in the galaxy M87, 55 million light years away, this wonderful glowing orange donut that we all know and love so well now. We literally can't see a black hole, but we can infer 
that black holes exist just as predicted by the mathematics of our best description of gravity called general relativity. But how do black holes come into existence? How does the universe make something so dense that it nearly punctures the fabric of space-time? One way is when an enormous star dies. After billions of years, a star can exhaust the fuel it needs to burn. And with no nuclear fusion to push it outward, gravity wins and the star collapses in on itself. And this collapse can be so severe that it creates a black hole. So could you make a black hole yourself? Perhaps if you just stuff enough jam inside a croissant. If you want to know the density needed to create a black hole, just pull out your textbook on gravity. I assume you all have a textbook on gravity next to your bedside, like I do, and find the black hole equation. It'll tell you for some given amount of mass, you don't need to know these details, but it'll for some given amount of mass, the size of the volume you'd need to pack that mass into to create a black hole determined by something called the Schwarzschild radius. For example, to make a black hole out of the earth, you'd need to pack the entirety of its mass into a sphere a little bigger than approximately one centimeter across. Most black holes that we know of are much bigger than this. In the center of our galaxy, the Milky Way, sits a black hole with a diameter about one third of the distance from the Earth to the Sun, but with a mass four million times that of the Sun. But there are much bigger black holes than that in other galaxies with masses tens of billions of times that of the sun packed into volumes much larger than our solar system. So are big black holes the only kind? If what I said is true, that a black hole happens when you take a given amount of mass and compress it into a certain size, can there be smaller black holes? In principle, yes. A few years ago, some astronomers suggested the existence of a ninth planet in our solar system, helpfully named Planet Nine, with an orbit far larger than that of Neptune to explain the unexpected behavior of some objects far, far away from the sun. The problem, detailed studies have observed precisely zero Planet Nines. But Planet Nine could actually be a black hole about the size of an apple, but with a mass five times that of Earth. Such a small black hole could have been created in the ultra hot and dense conditions just after the Big Bang and had been floating around the universe for billions of years to finally become stuck in our solar system. This is all conjecture at this point, but if Planet Nine exists, and if it's actually an apple-sized primordial black hole, it could provide us with a possible way to study a black hole up close, because black holes aren't just fascinating curiosities that are fun to wonder about. Black holes could be the best way we could ever hope to shed light on one of the most puzzling and frustrating mysteries of science. In physics, we have two fantastically good theoretical models that have withstood essentially all of our experimental tests. One is called general relativity, which describes how gravity works on very large scales, and the other is called quantum mechanics, which governs the world of the very small. 
Each of these by itself ranks among the most impressive intellectual achievements of humankind. But there's a problem. They can't both be right as currently understood. When we try to put these two separate theories together, everything breaks. We get nonsense answers like infinite energies or probabilities greater than one. When this happens, this is the universe's way of telling us to look closer. And the, two, and the place where these two theories collide in nature is a black hole. When you take a huge amount of mass, billions of times the mass of the sun, and try to compress it into a singularity, a one-dimensional point of zero volume and infinite density, you have to use both general relativity and quantum mechanics. If we knew what happens inside a black hole, we could solve one of the most baffling mysteries of science. But how? Most physicists are not convinced that Planet Nine, if it exists, is a black hole. And we won't be able to travel to any nearby large black holes anytime soon, maybe for hundreds or thousands of years. If ever, the nearest one is more than a thousand light years away. And worse, even if we traveled into a black hole, and even if some brave scientist dove in to study it from the inside, it would be physically impossible for her to send out what she learned back to the rest of us. It seems hopeless. How could we stuck here on earth ever hope to study a situation where we take a large amount of energy and mass and forcefully pack it into a small volume? Well, my colleagues and I create conditions like this all the time at the Large Hadron Collider at CERN. The Large Hadron Collider is a 27 kilometer circular tunnel on the border of France and Switzerland, buried 100 meters underground. And in this tunnel, we use superconducting magnets colder than outer space to accelerate protons. You're all made of protons to almost the speed of light and slam them into each other millions of times a second briefly recreating the conditions of our universe as they were just a fraction of a second after the Big Bang, 13.8 billion years ago, collecting a record of the debris from these collisions to search for evidence of undiscovered particles that could help us answer the biggest open questions in science. And it's entirely possible that one of the reasons we don't understand how gravity and quantum mechanics work together is because <clears throat> we're not looking at the fabric of space in the right way. Everything I've said about black holes so far assumes that there are only three dimensions of space. That kind of makes sense. You look around you, from what you can tell, there are only three dimensions of space, of course. But what if there are additional dimensions of space that are tiny curled up circles at every point in the universe and that are imperceptible to you and me? If this were true, it could immediately explain why gravity is so weak because you and I only experience a tiny three dimensional slice of gravity, whereas the rest of gravity leaks into these other spatial dimensions. And it would make it much easier to create a miniature black hole at the Large Hadron Collider. Recall that we said, under the usual assumptions to make a black hole, you need to pack a certain amount of stuff, energy and mass, into a given volume defined by the Schwarzschild radius. And when we collide two protons at the Large Hadron Collider, it's true that protons are very small, but we simply can't achieve high enough energies at CERN. We can't accelerate the protons to high enough speeds to pack them into a small enough volume to make a standard black hole. But if there are additional dimensions of space, 
then we would need to redefine what we mean by radius and volume. A radius in three dimensions is not exactly the same as a radius in four, five, six, or more dimensions. Thus, if there are additional dimensions of space, it's indeed possible that we could potentially create microscopic black holes when we collide protons at the Large Hadron Collider. And these tiny black holes would snap briefly into existence, vibrate into extra spatial dimensions, and then snap back into our 3D world and decay in a spectacular spray of particles that would hit our detectors with a particular pattern, which might look something like this. And this is a mock-up of my experiment that I work on at CERN called the ATLAS experiment. However, my colleagues and I have been colliding protons and taking data at the Large Hadron Collider for 10 years now. And so far, we see no evidence of these extra dimensions, no evidence of miniature black holes. Will miniature black holes show up at the Large Hadron Collider in the next 15 years of data taking. We don't know, but we'll never know until we look. Will tiny black holes show up at the next generation of Collider, four times as long and seven times as energetic as the Large Hadron Collider? We'll never know unless we look. Will they show up at a collider stretching around the moon? We'll never know unless we look, but how high do we need to go? Whether or not there are additional dimensions of space, if we really want to do it right, if we really want to understand how black holes work, we'd need to go big, really big. We'd need to achieve something called the Planck energy. And this is the energy at which gravity and quantum mechanics must have something to do with each other. If we were to collide particles at the Planck energy, everything would be revealed. We'd understand everything about gravity, quantum mechanics, dark matter, the Higgs boson, the nature of time, and yes, finally, black holes. But by some very crude estimates, to reach the Planck energy, we need to build a particle collider that stretches around <clears throat> the outer orbit of the solar system. Clearly, we're going to need some major innovation to make this happen. And by the time our civilization had advanced to the point where we could build such an experiment, it's likely we'll have advanced enough to be able to travel directly to a black hole and study it up close. So imagine yourself 500 years from now. You're traveling to explore a black hole up close for the first time. One day you get tired. You note that you should arrive at your destination in about 6,000 years. So you decide to take a 6,000 year long nap. After 6,000 years, you awake, prepare a cup of coffee, and you notice from your gravitational sensor that something is very wrong. You seem to be too close to the event horizon of your black hole. You peer out the window, and after your eyes adjust, you see in the distance an enormous, profoundly black disk in space, the light from the stars and galaxies behind it twisted and deformed. You stare into the center of this disk, a cosmic eye staring back at you, and it's the emptiest thing you've ever seen. Your jaw drops and your eyes widen, and you realize that you're not sure if you've passed the event horizon, the point of no return, yet you, you frantically double check your gravitational sensor to find out which direction points toward the biggest gravitational change, which would be the direction of the black hole's singularity middle 
and to find out where you would need to point your spaceship and fire the rockets at maximum power in the opposite direction to escape. And you notice you're not quite at the event horizon. You have five seconds to blast away. You jump from your seat, leaping toward the controls for the rockets and spill your coffee all over your hands, burning your fingers. You scream and fall to the ground. And by the time you get up, it's too late. You're passing the event horizon of the black hole. You nearly stop breathing. Your mouth is dry and you close your eyes. You can't believe that this could possibly be happening. You open your eyes and gaze out the window again and everything looks about the same. The ominous black disc is getting larger, but otherwise nothing is different. You, you feel the same. You think maybe your time estimate was wrong. Maybe there's, there's still a chance to, to escape. You triple check your gravitational sensor and it says that no matter which direction you point it, you are pointing toward the singularity of the black hole. In every direction this way, your path leads to the singularity. The opposite direction, your path leads to the singularity. And then you know for sure you've passed the event horizon. You're inside a black hole. A calm terror settles over you. How did you get in this situation? Very slowly, while you were asleep, the conditions of the universe around you were, were steadily changing. It was almost imperceptible at first. Your spaceship noticed that some of the light in one direction seemed a bit different, a bit bent, but nothing extremely alarming. But then after a long period of things changing slightly, slowly, suddenly everything changed drastically. And you realize that the world around you was very different. And floating in your spaceship inside the event horizon of a black hole, what do you do? You, you might start thinking of possible escapes, it, even though you know intellectually there's no way to travel back outside the event horizon. You go through all of the options. Is, is there something you've missed? I mean, Maybe it's possible that, that all the clever scientists were wrong and there's, there's some unknown way to escape that hadn't been anticipated. You start daydreaming that if you're just lucky or if you just wait long enough, the situation will sort itself out and you may eventually pass back over the event horizon again and could zoom away from the black hole back to the way things were, to the universe you previously knew. And as you're daydreaming, you look down and you notice that your feet are drifting away from you and your legs are being stretched into long, thin, spaghetti-like tubes, and then suddenly your shoes are so far away that you can't see them anymore. And in that split second before you reach the singularity, you realize two things. One, that no one really knows what happens in the middle of a black hole. And two, that there is literally no going back to the way things were before. The only way out, if there is a way out, is directly through the black hole. What's at the other end of a black hole? No one knows. 
Some think that when we understand how gravity and quantum mechanics work together, we'll see how there's really nothing at the other end. Nothing. Maybe there is no real singularity at the center of a black hole, and black holes just collect all the stuff they eat and pack it tightly inside like a greedy squirrel the size of the entire solar system, and then slowly radiate it away nearly imperceptibly. And after they run out of food, after about a trillion, 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 trillion years of radiation, much, much, much longer than the current age of the universe, they will finally exhaust everything and then evaporate in a blip. Others think that black holes could be bridges to other points in space-time. If you look closely at the equations of general relativity, under certain conditions, you can create a black hole that can open up in one point of space and time, but then whatever goes in gets spit out in a completely different point, far away in space and possibly far away in time in the future or in the past? Current studies seem to suggest that these conditions may not exist in our universe, but research is ongoing. Still others think that black holes could be portals to another universe. Is it possible that our universe began 13.8 billion years ago as a black hole that opened up in a different universe. These ideas are captivating to me, but if you accidentally fell into a black hole, you likely wouldn't be thinking about them. You'd likely be panicking and thinking, why did this happen? Why do black holes even exist? But that's the wrong question. Asking why black holes exist is like asking why a pandemic that grinds society to a halt exists. The answer, it's because the background conditions were arranged in such a way to lead to the existence of such a thing. And if you understand the conditions, you will understand the catastrophe. Sometimes reality, for whatever reason, gets twisted beyond recognition, nearly to the point of delirium and madness. For black holes, the fabric of space-time itself is twisted beyond recognition. And for society, in a moment like now, for many people, daily life, life is an absurd cartoon compared to what it once was. COVID is killing our loved ones. Far-right politicians are gaining power by pushing fraudulent, racist, and misogynistic lies. The climate crisis is nearly guaranteed to render our planet uninhabitable in a few decades. Society is a twisted, often incomprehensible catastrophe. We seem to be heading into the center of a societal black hole. But such catastrophes are also golden opportunities for new knowledge and change for the better, for physics. If we were to be able to study a black hole up close, we would learn untold things about nature, about how quantum mechanics and general relativity relate, and about our human place in the universe. For society, the current moment is a golden opportunity to stop and think critically about the conditions that led to this moment, our voraciously extractive relationship to the environment that makes new viruses and pandemics more likely, our political and economic systems that have created and exacerbated the wealth inequality, racism, sexism, misogyny, deprivation of the global South and unequally distributed opportunities many of us face daily, a system that has led to the fact that the richest people in the world, in the middle of a public health and economic crisis, jobs vanishing, millions dying, 
regular people unable to pay their rents, black people rioting for their right to exist around the world, the richest people are getting richer and richer. We cannot go back. This is the danger of a moment like this. Centrist politicians across Europe, many of whom have placed their career prospects and business interests above the lives of human beings while they mismanaged the COVID crisis, they won't fix European society. Changing the president of the United States won't fix United States society. And when any of us says that they wish to go back to the way things were, that just means that we have neither recognized the severity of the situation, nor have we confronted the fact that the way things were was not good. Before this pandemic, society was broken, and it still is today. It's built on a fraudulent, exploitative system. The world is never returning to its former state. It's been unfathomably twisted, just like a black hole. But just as if you found yourself inside a black hole, it does no good to wish that you could go back outside of it. You physically could not. We should instead ask ourselves, what's at the other end of a black hole? Will we be crushed into oblivion or will we emerge on the other side with new knowledge of the universe, new knowledge of the conditions that created the black hole, new and better knowledge of the way the conditions of society were arranged to lead to our crisis situation. Will we emerge on the other side of this socio-political black hole to a new and better beginning? The only way we can do this is if we understand better what connects us. If you fell into a black hole, you'd be completely isolated and alone. But today, we're all in this catastrophe together. Society, politics, economics are currently set up to encourage us as a collective to waste our time and distract us for, from realizing that if we were to cooperate, we would be much stronger and could take back the wealth that was been uh, allowed to accumulate into the hands of a tiny number of people. For example, our current medical research landscape is set up to compel dozens of pharmaceutical companies to compete in secrecy. This means that we have very bright scientists and now we have multiple possible candidates for, for vaccines for COVID. We do not know their efficacy on the long term, but this means that we have very bright scientists wasting their time on the same drugs and treatments. If we had a different setup, would we already have a set of COVID treatments that we all have access to right now? If we recognized what connects us, the desire to live in health and security is much stronger than what separates us, the entirety of society would improve. And in physics, under the current conditions, only a relatively small percentage of humans are born into the right situation to even be able to consider pursuing physics research. What voices and perspectives are we missing? What if the little girl who will eventually have the insight that connects gravity and quantum mechanics currently lives with a family who has no possibility of ever sending her to university? Can we, as a society, find the courage to center what connects us and fix those things that separate us for the good of science? This is also true in your life and work. In this unique catastrophic situation, are you taking the opportunity to figure out what better connects you to others in your school, in your field, in your workplace? Collaborators, clients, customers, new positions, new markets, new people that can show you some new thing that you've never thought about studying, new jobs entirely, and new beginnings? Or are you still secretly thinking about and hoping for a time when everything will return to normal? There is no going back and we shouldn't want that. We owe it to the least privileged amongst us, those who aren't lucky enough to join such an excellent event here at Musee Trento, to allow ourselves the bravery and courage of imagining a better way to construct society than the one that led to the current catastrophic situation. If we can't summon the courage to imagine 
and construct a better society, surely our society will be crushed into oblivion. Because when I see the government of the United States putting children into cages on the Mexico-US border, and when I see otherwise smart people all around Europe being persuaded to vote for racist, misogynistic political parties, fooled by fraudulent imaginary narratives about migration, and when I see how we've allowed decades of uncontrolled fossil fuel extraction to destroy the Earth's climate and we're not acting fast enough to fix it. And, and when I think about how, when I was a kid, my classmates would mock and bully Melody because of the color of her skin and how this made it difficult for her to attend class and how she never went to high school. I feel angry, but it's not just regular anger. Oh, I, I feel regular anger too, but as a physicist, I feel an extra layer of anger because I see how when we allow these things to happen, we're betraying a cosmic truth that we are all parts of the same universe and we're all in this universe together. And so back on that red rock in Southern Utah, when I was a child, I said, wow, a black hole sounds terrible and really lonely. And we were silent for a very long time. And finally, Melody said, well, don't worry. If you fell into a black hole, I'd jump in after you. And I looked at her and I said, thanks, me too. And we gazed up at the night sky, the Milky Way swirling and twisting across the cosmos. Thanks. Dr. Beecham, thank you from me and from our audience. Actually, we are getting a lot of compliments. Your voice is clear and uh, your Good. reasoning is impressive. And we are Good. also getting some questions for Great. you. If, if you allow me, I will uh, move on to them. So let's start. Gianfranco asks, is it possible to proceed faster than light inside Event Horizon? Does it mean that general relativity law is not valid inside of that space? That is an excellent question. You can still hear me, yeah? <laughs> yeah, sure. Okay, good. Um, that's an excellent question, and it's one of the most important open questions that we have. So if we were to able to go inside of a black hole, this is one of the things that we would be able to test. But the answer about... Uh, the 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 suspect the suspicion of the answer um, is the following. Partially, what you're getting at is when I said that uh, you know space is going faster than the speed of light. Every you know bright person in the audience should immediately go, "Wait a minute, that doesn't sound right, right?" Because it does not sound right, right? What's the fastest that anything can possibly move in the universe? What we're told is the speed of light. However. That's the fastest speed that any signal or anything can move through space. Space can do whatever it wants. So in fact, in general relativity, space itself, it doesn't have material. It's not made of anything. That's why the analogies break down. The metaphor of a rubber sheet or, uh, you know, like a, you know, a, a sinkhole made of dirt. The analogy breaks down because in those analogies, there's stuff there. There's dirt particles or there's pieces of the rubber sheet. In actuality, in space, space isn't made of anything. But space, you can tell when the grid itself, sort of like the background grid, is, is moving. And that's what the sensation of gravity is in general relativity. So what's going faster than the speed of light is not a signal. It's not a spaceship. It's not even a photon. It's space itself. And that's OK. That doesn't violate any, anything in general relativity or physics. Thank you very much. Another question is about uh, the Nobel Prizes. Um, during the last years, two Nobel Prizes were awarded to astrophysics. Uh, the first one for the studies about the gravitational waves and then for the ones about black holes. Uh, are we living a golden age of astrophysics? 
<laughs> I absolutely think we are living in a golden age of physics. And I think that this is a wonderful time for or anyone who is thinking about getting into physics, maybe they're trying to decide what to study. Now is a great time. Basically, there's never been a better time to be a fundamental physicist studying these things, whether astrophysics, you know, gal uh, galaxies and astronomy and, you know, black hole photos, these, this, you know, this uh, glowing orange donut, you know, or particle physics like what I do because they're all connected, right? Because there's so many open questions that we have, questions that we know have to have answers, but we don't know where to go to answer those questions. So right now is a perfect time to get into particle physics or astrophysics because of exactly what you're saying. We end up having these wonderful uh, steps forward, but very often the step forward just opens up a bunch of other questions that we don't know the answer to. And so I definitely think we're living in a golden age of astronomy, but uh, you know, in astrophysics, but not just astrophysics, physics in general, because, you know, the, the gravitational wave discovery was fantastic. And of course, one of the one of the one of the gravitational waves that we can detect is when two black holes collide. That's amazing, right? I mean, that's that's that was a theorized a long time ago. And the fact that we've actually seen or you know heard in a way evidence of that is just a wonderful, you know, wonderful place to be. Yeah. So it's definitely a golden age of uh, of astrophysics right now, but also of particle physics, because again, the other thing about the Large Hadron Collider, again, these kind of things are connected, right? It's something you learn in a in a you know an astronomy experiment is connected to what we learn in a particle physics experiment. You know, dark matter, black holes, uh, uh, you know, neutrinos, things like this, and the the answers all connect to each other. And so wherever where you have, wherever you end up doing some studying or whatever you're interested in, these these things will all be connected to each other. But on the particle physics side, what I do. It's also really fascinating because the Large Hadron Collider, we discovered this thing called the Higgs boson in 2012, but so far we haven't discovered anything else in the sense of something new. But what we have done is we've ruled out a very large number of possibilities. And as you know, in the history of science, when you have a null result, when you have the lack of a discovery, this in fact can be the thing that you need to spur, your on, spur you on to where the big discovery will be hiding. So that being said, we've also only taken about 5% of all of the data that we will take in the future at the Large Hadron Collider. So it's premature to say that, you know, that we've discovered everything at the Large Hadron Collider. We're just getting started. So right now is a golden age, not just of astrophysics, but of physics in general. Thank you, Dr. Bicham. May I uh, remind you that we have an Italian translation. I'm telling you that because yes. you are speaking much faster. <laughs> and so if you can slow down just a little bit, it will be of help. And a comment from Saberia. I would like to share this extraordinary event with my students. So your uh, thoughts and your knowledge, not only in science, but also uh, your positions uh, are... Um, are very welcome to many people of uh, different uh, different types, I guess. And uh, another comment about uh, the fact that you're absolutely brilliant, and I agree. And I go to <laughs> another question. I'm curious about the community of CERN. What is the percentage of women and men working over there? Yeah, so that's a very good question. So first of all, thanks for the comment uh, about uh, the talk, and uh, I'm happy to share the you know my passion about science with anybody who wants to listen. Um, the the percentage of women at CERN, honestly, I don't know what the current percentage is in particle physics in general. It has hovered uh, shamefully around 10, 15 percent. Uh, in the last few years. And that's in fact uh, a big improvement upon previous years when it was something like, you know, five to five to seven percent. So there have we have made strides, but we still have a long way to go. Um, the percentages are not even close to where we where we need them, right? To really have uh, a robust and a full and complete, you know, uh, representation of humanity working on these questions. So the percentage, I, I don't actually know. I think you can probably Google it uh, more efficiently than I could tell you, but it is still not nearly what we need it to be. Um, and the uh, part of this comes from, well, part of the challenge is that like in a lot of fields, we're pretty good in science and in physics, we're pretty good at attracting you know kids to study physics because come on, every single human deep down inside is still at heart a curious human being, a curious little kid. 
So everyone, you know, everyone in a, in, a, in a decent percentage will be attracted to physics at the early stages. The part we're really bad at is as you get higher up in the hierarchy, as the you know more senior positions, there are fewer and fewer women in charge of things. There are some notable exceptions. For example, for Italy, I don't have to tell you, Fabiola Gianotti, right, is the director, the, the director general of CERN for, for quite some time now. So we have prominent examples, but you look over all universities and over all uh, senior positions in particle physics, and we do very, very poorly. There's a lot of reasons we could talk for a very long time about why that is and ways that we need to a address this, but that's the state of things right now. We're working on it. We need better ideas and better policies, though. It's true. Thank you very much. Another question. Our audience is quite quite active and I love it. Since you Good. trained as a filmmaker and you collaborate with artists, what role plays and how important is art in science and in the scientific dissemination for you? This is a good one. Very good question. So to me, art and science are not really too dissimilar, but not in a trivial way, if that makes sense. What I mean is that to me, art and science are really two different modes of human inquiry, right? To me, they're two different ways by which humans ask and sometimes answer questions about the world around us, right? In science, we ask questions in a very controlled way about the basic, you know, physical laws of the universe, uh, you know, uh, about, you know, we have these open questions about, you know, exactly what's inside of a black hole, what's outside of the universe, you know, why every single one of you has about a billion particles of something called dark matter flowing through your body every second. And we have no idea what this is, these kinds of questions. And we can decide, we can design experiments to try to answer these questions. And in art, what you're doing is you are instead asking, sometimes asking questions that are not even really so well-defined, but they're more about the, you know, the, the physical, sorry, the more about the emotional or psychological or political or, you know, social uh, rules around us that govern the way that we, re we act. And if you think about that, that's similar to what's going on in say physics, because particle physics is, and science, is asking questions about the basic laws that govern everything around us physically. So in my, in, in my, you know, in my, in my view, these two things, art and science, are two different modes of human inquiry. Obviously, we, you know, the, the methods can be very, very, are very, very different, right? And the way that we judge the outcome are, is very, very different. I, I mean, for example, I, I would hate it if the entire artistic community got together and said, uh, we wrote a paper and we have decided this is the only one valid way to appreciate a Botticelli. I would not want that to happen, right? But you can do that in science. And so even, so there's some differences uh, to these different disciplines, but they are, to my mind, two different modes of humans trying to understand better our place in either the universe or society itself. And the places where they kind of intersect, that I think is really interesting. That to me, um, so the, the, types of ex the types of projects that I like to do are, Ones where, you know, a science science minded artist and then maybe an artist minded scientist, they get a chance to come together with their different backgrounds and think about some idea in a new way and hopefully open up a new space where new new art artistic and maybe scientific ideas can flow in. So that's the sort of short version, maybe not so short. That's the short version of why art and science are interesting to me. Thank you very much. Another question, um, and I am translating it from Italian. If you want, of course, you can post your questions in Italian and I will try to translate them. Uh, if you were able to generate a very um, small black hole at LHC, what could be its uh, um, gravitational how strong would uh, its uh, gravitational attraction would be? That is a very, very good question. Um, and it's of course a question that anyone should ask themselves when 
we start talking about making miniature black holes at the Large Hadron Collider because obviously you don't want to make a gigantic black hole to suck in the Earth. That would be a very, very bad idea. The black holes that we're talking about at the Large Hadron Collider are technically black holes in the way that I mentioned in the talk. So because these are kinds of quantum black holes that are very, very small, First of all, there's not nearly enough energy and mass to put into these collisions to make a macroscopic black hole. It's just impossible. It's, it's just, so the gravitational pull is negligible. There's no gravitational pull even that you'll be able to measure at all. But the interesting thing about them is that you might be able to create this little object that does in fact wobble into other extra spatial dimensions, more than three, and this little wobble technically satisfies the extended equations of what it what it means to be a black hole, but it's not a black hole in the same way as the one in the middle of our galaxy. So this would be technically a miniature black hole and it would immediately evaporate. And if this is in fact something you can calculate, you can calculate if you want to, the evaporation time of a black hole. <laughs> so a black hole in the middle of uh, our galaxy, again, the evaporation time for that black hole is probably on the order of, I said something like trillion, 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 trillion years, something like 10 to the power 64, 67 years. It's so far beyond our universe time, uh, our universe's age that we can't even envision it. But the ones at the, at the microscopic kind at the Large Hadron Collider, would evaporate immediately and they'd have basically no gravitational pull. There's nothing to worry about, but there is something very, very potentially fascinating to discover. And so we are sure that this mini black hole would not uh, eat the entire planet Earth, are we? You have my guarantee. Okay, <laughs> very good. So next uh, question, uh, while describing the fall into a black hole, all of us could picture it. What is the role of imagination in your work as a scientist? That's a very, very good question. And it's such, it's the type of question that it's almost so much a part of our DNA as physicists that we, we kind of don't even think about it anymore. And so when someone asks the question, you go, oh, I, I guess that's true. There is a lot of imagination in physics and it makes sense too, right? I mean, if whether you were good at physics or you liked physics or you like it now in your classes or not, think back to what physics really is. Physics is about the physical world, right? And the way that we operate in the physical world, you know, before language, before mathematics, before anything, just you as a, an animal, you, you know, taking in inputs, you react to things that are physically around you. And what it does is that your brain thinks about relationships between physical things. And so physics as a discipline and any type of physics is really about, you know, you don't have to be a super genius to be a physicist. Absolutely not. You do not have to be a super genius to work at CERN. Let me say that very clearly. I would not call myself a super genius. Maybe somebody else would call it. No, but <laughs> what I'm saying is that what being a particle physics a physicist is about tapping into that deep down inside childlike curiosity and imagination that we all still have. And some people it's buried more than others and allowing it to blossom, to flourish, to roam free because that little piece there allows you to think in a very pure way about relationships among physical quantities. And so you start with the kind of standard things. You, you, know, you close your eyes and you think, wait, okay, so the earth is going around the sun Okay, but it's also falling toward the sun. And you think about that in a particular way and you envision it, you imagine what that looks like. And then that allows you to then take the next step. Okay, what about, you know, what about gravity as uh, instead of, instead of like, you know, instead of the earth and the sun having like a rubber band between them and going around. Instead, what about the, the, the sun is making a, a hole in space and the earth is falling toward it all the time. This is really, this is, this is absolutely necessary to do what we do. You cannot be a physicist without having, uh, you know, a necessarily exercised imagination, but that's the key point. You don't have to be 
just naturally sort so somehow kind of like the naturally you know brilliant person the naturally imaginative person imagination is something we all have and it's something you can exercise and you can get better like a muscle so that's really what physics is all about it, and especially in you know all kinds of physics especially in astrophysics and particle physics you need to think in a very kind of physical way obviously about the relationships amongst things and it can be something very simple and then start getting once you've once you've exercised this faculty this possibility then it starts to get into a little bit more complex things like mathematical quantities and how they relate together and then how they map into the physical world so imagination it plays a fundamental role in physics and especially in particle physics and astrophysics we have a comment uh, on the fact that scientists should communicate more often to inspire and improve people awareness i think that you agree on that given that you dedicate part of your work to dissemination isn't it yes i absolutely agree with that was that a question or was it just a comment because I, I agree i it's something that i i find that i get it's almost as though i get as much from communicating with people who are not specialists than what they might get from me i don't know what they get from me and i hope that they get some kind of ideas or little sparks of things to follow up on later but the thing that it does for you as a scientist and anybody as a thinker you know as a, as a professional or anything when you compel yourself to you know because when you do something for a long time it becomes just a part of your tunnel right it's just sort of like your tunnel and you exist there and it's the it's the wallpaper on your tunnel right in a way but then when you have to stop and explain your wallpaper tunnel to someone else, you start noticing how much of what you think you know is just based upon a kind of muscle memory. And that only allows you to do your research in a particular you know, tunnel. What if in your kind of intellectual world, you were to break the walls of the tunnel because you had to explain what you did to someone who is not one of your colleagues, you might be able to see a new perspective on your own research. So that's one of the things that I think that's why I encourage my colleagues to to uh, communicate with uh, people who are not you know specialists as much as they can, because it really does compel you to think critically about your work and to explain it in a way that someone else gets a sense as to why you do what you do. And also why, also why the questions that we answer are in fact totally relevant to you. I mean, the Large Hadron Collider, at the first glance, it kind of seems, why does that Why does that matter to me? But then if you think about it and maybe you get a chance to talk to somebody who does the research, you start realizing, ah, the questions they're asking are very similar to the questions that I ask myself as, as, as any human asks themselves, like, why are we here? <laughs> How does everything work around us? And where are we going? Those are the types of questions that we ask. And I think that many people are fascinated by science and its communication. We have Juliana, who I think is a teacher because she writes, I went with my students for three times at CERN and it was, we were very, very lucky. Okay, and thank you, Juliana, for your comment. Another question from Gianfranco, do you think that science could help society to rediscover a collective ethic? Or could science be the reason why society lost a collective ethic? This is a very good question, Gianfranco. Um, and it's something that I think about a lot, in fact. Um, my first answer to the first part of the question would be, I hope so, um, because one of the things that I feel that we have we 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 have lost, I, I you know I think you kind of got the point from the the very last part of the talk. One of the things that I think that we have lost is the sense that we you know collaboration is much much stronger than someone working in a in a vacuum by themselves. And I think that because of the over, you know, the predominant uh, sociopolitical system that we have around the world, it encourages us all to think as though it's kind of every person for themselves, right? This happens in business. This happens sometimes in schools. It happens in social, you know, social media, all these kinds of things. And that's, you know, sometimes that's, of course, true. But 
we're, we're a society. I mean, society is about society. It's about social things. And so, you know, this, this part of recognizing that our duty, our highest possible duty is not just to ourselves, not just me, it's to the community of everyone. It, it, you know, is something that I think that we've unfortunately lost. And I would love for science to be able to not necessarily show. I mean, I, I don't think you can ever prove. There's no way to like prove that, uh, that you know, thinking, uh, taking care of each other in communities is objectively the best thing to do. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that in science, we recognize over and over and over and over that the best possible discoveries are the ones that are made when diverse groups of people from different perspectives come together to work and bring new perspectives to an idea or an open question that allows us to recognize, to see that question in a new way and to hopefully solve it and to move forward to the next one. So if you were able to take that as part of the lesson of science and somehow port that over to society and also in general to an ethical uh, framework, I think that would be fantastic. Again, I think that you know, it, it, certain times, okay, it's okay to, you know, think about yourself. You have to, of course, you know, make, build your own career and those kinds of things. But at the end of the day, the things that we've lost and arguably the biggest problems that we face in society are because we have been convinced that we are supposed to all compete for these, you know, for a tiny bit of resources, these scraps that we're supposed to fight over, right? It makes no sense that that we should have in, in in such a rich society. It makes no sense that we should have anyone losing their job or losing their house or losing their you know or losing their life in a pandemic like this because they don't have money to pay their rent or to pay for healthcare in the United States, for example. When at the same time, Elon Musk like doubled his wealth. That makes no sense at all. And because, and we see these things in the news and, you know, sort of our reaction for a lot of people is like, wow, that's a rich guy. The reaction instead should be, how did we allow our society to get into this mess? That's crazy. So again, this sort of ethical framework, I would hope we would be able to take from big, you know, collaborative, open scientific uh, exploits like CERN, the International Space Station, things like that. Thank you, Dr. Beecham. We have the time for a very last question. You suggest that there are so many huge and fascinating things to discover that spending time with prejudices or obstacles is just nonsense. Do you think that teaching from an early school age this kind of reasoning could help in changing the world for the better? Uh, again, I, my answer is I would hope so. Um, this is, uh, this is one of my highest aspirations. One of my deepest, uh, desires would be to, from a very early age, um, inculcate or, uh, or, you know, build in to every human, the kind of defense against the cynicism of the outer world and the, the, these kind of, these kind of, uh, to my mind, destructive influences of what we were talking about, the broader socio-political uh, spectrum that says that we're all only out for ourselves and that, you know, everyone's trying to steal things from you and you have to, you know, you have to beat someone else to win something yourself. And instead, remind everybody that as you're a baby, you, you don't think those things, uh, you know, you, you, as you're growing up, you realize that cooperation, collaboration is much, much, much stronger than one person by themselves. And so I would love, I that's my, one of my highest goals, my highest aspirations is to convince everyone that from a, from a we should teach children, teach humans from a very early age to re retain a defense against that cynicism. Because you know the broader the broader socio-political perspective is constantly, constantly. You know, breaking that down and compels us to think that we need to operate only solely for a, for a very selfish perspective rather than a, a, collaborative, uh, a collaborative approach. That's, that's one of my deepest desires. And if someone has brilliant ideas as to how to do that, or especially if anybody out there is actually a teacher or a, a, you know, a professor or a caregiver or anyone that's, that's doing your best to remind your children, to remind the students, to remind anybody that this is what connects us, that the things that connect us are much, much stronger than the things that separate us. You have my absolute eternal thanks. And I 
applaud you and please keep going because you are the people that are going to help create and construct this better society that I spoke of in the talk. Thank you. And thank you very much, Dr. Beecham, for joining us and for presenting uh, these uh, your ideas, which were really fascinating. I thank you very much. Our time is my over. Pleasure. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you again. And uh, I want to thank, uh, of all, um, um, obviously, I want to thank our audience. Please uh, do not uh, um, miss the opportunity of checking the website of Muse and IPSA for the upcoming event. And also the personal website of Dr. Beecham uh, in order to um, have uh, some information about uh, upcoming talks uh, and for their news and for more mind-blowing physics. I also thank Max, Alessandro and Valentino for the technical assistance and our translation made by Maria Cristina Massa and Anna De Poli. Thank you again and good night. Thank you. Ciao, grazie.